In this video, I will talk about the multinomial probatin logit models, the conditional logit model, and the mixed logit model. As an overview, I will first go over the multinomial outcome dependent variable, how this variable is defined when we have multiple choices. Then I will talk about the wide and long forms of data sets that we can have. Then I will talk about the independent variables and how they can be either alternative invariant or alternative variant. Then I will talk about the multinomial logit model, how it's defined, the coefficients, marginal effects, and IIA, and the multinomial probit model. Then I will talk about the conditional logit model, including the coefficients and marginal effects, and I will conclude with the mixed logit model. At this point, if you're not familiar with the binary probit and logit model, which means the dependent variable is a zero-one variable, perhaps you might want to watch first those videos on my website and then come back at, um, and continue with this lecture. Okay, so let's get started. Um, here I would like to give you a few examples of multinomial outcome uh, variables. The first one is if we have a type of insurance contract that an individual selects. So it could be either uh, a contract with some specifications or other specifications or t third type of specifications. It could be um, different products that individual selects like type of cereal or type of meat or something like that that they eat. It could be an occupational choice by an individual. Uh, they could work either for business, for academic, or non-profit organization. And finally, the example that we will consider here is the choice of a fishing boat, either beach, pier, private boat, or charter boat. So notice one thing about these four examples that I give you. Uh, first of all, the dependent variable y would be a categorical unordered variable. So categorical means it's a category uh, that we have. Um, and unordered means that there's no natural order of these choices. It's not like um, one is higher than another or, or something like that, as we will see is the case later on with the ordered probit and logit models. But that's not the case here. They're unordered. The next assumption that we can have here is that an individual may select only one alternative. So therefore, it, in, this, um, in these examples here, we would, if an individual is faced with several products, they could eat only one of them, and they, they can't uh, have several of them. Next assumption is that the choices or categories um, are typically coded as J equals 1, 2, and so on until M. That's how we're going to code that. And these are called the alternatives. Now, they don't have to be coded with numbers. They could be coded with uh, their description, like business, academic, or nonprofit organizations. Sometimes, for convenience, though, we code it with numbers. Most software could read either numbers or a word with letters, it doesn't matter for them. If we do use numbers, there are only codes and their magnitude cannot be interpreted. Um, so we, we cannot use means to summarize the dependent variable. If categories are used, that would make no sense. So we would need to use frequency for each category to summarize the dependent variable, not means. Next thing I'd like to talk about is that the data usually recorded in two formats, a wide format or a long format. Uh, when we use the wide format, the data for each individual i would be recorded on one row, and the dependent variable would be y equals j, where this j is 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, as many choices that we have. That would be our dependent variable. When we're using the long format, on the other hand, the data for each individual i would be recorded on j rows where j is the number of alternatives. So the dependent variable yj would be equal to 1 if y equals j and to 0 if y does not equal j. 
So in this case, we have yj equals 1 if the alternative j is the observed outcome and the remaining yk would be equal to 0. So for each observation, only one of the y1s through yms would be 0, and that's the one for which the individual, uh, that, that the individual selected. The rest would be equal to 0. Okay, so let me give you a quick example of these, and I made up those numbers and categories just to illustrate. So in the table that you see here, we have an example of the multinomial data in a wide format. So look at how each row of the table is the uh, person. So person 1, 2, 3, 4, or however you want to call them, you can call them by people's names. Then the dependent variable y, suppose that that's a choice between orange juice, apple juice, or something like that. And it would have more alternatives than, than just two. But suppose that the first person picked apple juice, the second picked orange juice, and the third one picked orange juice. So here, the codes for y would be y equals to 1 for the first individual, and for the second and the third, y would be equal to 2. They picked these other choices. So this is the choice for the first one, alternative 1, and y equals 1, and the choices for the other two is y equals 2. The next variable that we have, wi, or income, uh, let's suppose this is in U.S. dollars, and um, we would have, you know, different values for different um, in individuals. And then we would have these um, independent variables that would also vary by choice, and I will talk about these a little bit more in detail later. Um, so look at this. Um, so individual 1 faces this price for alternative 1 and this price for alternative 2 and the individual picked alternative 1. For individual 2 this was their price for 1 and this was the price for alternative 2 they picked that one and so on these guys picked that one. You could say well how can the price differ? Well maybe these people went to different grocery stores or, or they live in different cities so the price for these alternatives can differ for them. But they only have one income, notice that thing. Um, there's no like different income depending on what kind of juice they drink, right? So notice this thing. Now we would consider exactly the same data set here, but instead of each person having one row, we would have, for each person, we would have two rows, one for each alternative. So this is how it's going to look like. So notice that a person one is repeated twice because we have two choices. A person two is re repeated twice and so on. So we would repeat each person for as many choices as we have or alternatives. And here for each person we would list alternative one, two, one, two, one, two. And the codes yj this time would be equal to one if the person selected that choice. So remember the first one selected the first alternative and zero otherwise. And notice that for guy number two and three, they have values of one for their second alternative because they picked the second alternative and the rest of these numbers would be zero. So if we had two, three, four choices, the rest of those numbers would be equal to zero. Now, if we have income or something like that that doesn't vary um, by individuals, notice that we would repeat that one because, well, the person only has one income, doesn't vary by, by alternatives. And the prices that we have for these alternatives they were on one row here, and now they're on two rows. So uh, look at how they're, um, they're recorded here and compare this to the table before. So some uh, software require that the data is in the long format, and some of them require that they're in the wide format. So if your data comes in different ways, you may need to restructure your data depending on what the software wants in order to estimate these models. Okay, so let's continue. The multinomial density for the one observation would be defined as P1 to the power of 1 and all the way times PM to the power of YM. So here, what's the chance of that alternative 1 happening or being chosen? To the power of Y1, and we're multiplying all of these. Uh, uh, all of these. 
And so here we would have the product of pj to the power of yj. That would be the density. So the probability that individual i would choose the jth alternative would be uh, the probability that yi would be equal to j would be equal to fj, xi, and, and beta. So this function of form would be selected so that the probabilities lie between 0 and 1, and they sum um, over all the j's to 1, which means um, the choice, the, the probability that an individual would select one, any of the alternatives would be equal to 1. Okay. So now we have different functional forms of fj would lead to different uh, models. And here we're repeating pretty much the same discussion as we had when we discussed the binary probit and logit models before. Okay, so I first gave you the example and now I will talk a little bit more about the independent variables. We would have two types of independent variables. The first one would be alternative invariant or case-specific regressors. And these regressors wi would vary over individual i but do not vary over the alternative j. So these are variables like income, age, education. They would be different for each individual but they do not vary based on the type of product that the individual selects. So there's only one income no matter what product you select. And these types of variables are used in the multinomial logic model. On the other hand, we have alternative variant or alternative specific regressors. And these regressors would be x, i, j. They would vary over individual i and over the alternative j. And in this case, we had the prices for products vary for each product. And the individual also may pay different prices. So remember the example that I gave you before. So um, salaries for occupation may be different between occupations and also for each individual. So here notice that these salaries would differ. That's not like the previous uh, example of income that that is in the um, uh, for the alternative invariant uh, regressors. And these type of variables are used in the conditional and mixed logic models. Um, but if they don't vary across the alternatives, then we use them in the multinomial uh, models. Okay, so this is the multinomial logic model uh, that is used with alternative invariant regressors. And the probability that individual i will select an alternative j is p of yi equals j. And then we have exponent of wi gamma j divided by the summation of all exponents of the same thing as above from k equals to 1 to from 1 to m so what we have here is that all the alternatives that we have remember we have m alternatives 1 2 3 and so on until m we're summing up those exponents in the denominator and in the numerator we only have the exponent of wi gamma j and that j coefficient here notice is the same as the probability of y equals j so these probabilities uh, for choosing each alternative would sum up to one why because we have each of each one of them repeated here in the, in the numerator and when we sum all of them up we would have the same expression as in the bottom so that's why they do sum up to one now let me ask you this question what would happen if we only have two choices? If we only have two choices, we're back to the binary logic model. And what happens is that we typically will talk about this, that we normalize one set of the coefficients to be equal to zero because we can't estimate both sets. And if we normalize this of, say, um, gamma 1 to be equal to zero, uh, and this expression here is zero, we have exponent to a uh, to the power of 0, we would have a 1. So this expression would be here 1 divided by 1 plus exponent of the yi gamma 2. And this is exactly what we had for the binary uh, for the binary model. So everything that we talk about here for the multinomial logic model also would apply to the binary one, but it's a little bit more complicated. 
So we uh, need to normalize one of these sets of coefficients to be equal to zero because otherwise we don't have a defined problem. We can't estimate the models. So we would be estimating j minus one sets of coefficients. And the coefficients of the other alternatives would be interpreted in reference to the base outcome. Okay, so we would say that if we see a coefficient for alternative j, we would say that in comparison to the base alternative, an increase in the independent variable would make the selection of alternative j more or less likely. So just like the binary, uh, just like the binary model interpretation. Okay, so for the mi for the marginal effects, um, they would be uh, an increase of a regressor on the probability of selecting alternative J. And so we would have DP of IJ over D of WI would be equal to PIJ gamma J minus uh, gamma I bar. And so this term that you have here would be an average of all the coefficients. So because of this term here, notice that we wouldn't know if this term here is higher or lower than this term. So we wouldn't know if uh, that would be actually a positive or a negative number or, or um, uh, what, what would happen. So that's why the marginal effects do not necessarily correspond inside to the coefficients. So this is the coefficient gamma j on the alternative j. But because we're subtracting a number, we don't know if that's going to end up the same sign or not. So that's the one very confusing thing about the multinomial uh, models is that whatever signs the coefficients have, it's not necessary that the marginal effects are of the same sign. So there may be j minus 1 sets of coefficients, but they would be j sets of marginal effects in here. And depending on which alternative we select as a base category, the coefficients would be different in reference to the base category, but the marginal effects will be the same regardless of, the, of, of which one we pick for the base category. Uh, because marginal effects are not interpreted in, in respect to any base category. They're just an increase, you know, an increase in the independent variable, what effect would that have on the probability? There's no normal normalization here. And the other thing is that the marginal effects for each variable would sum up to zero. So why is that? First of all, um, you can think of how like uh, an in how a person is either likely to select one or another or another or another choice, as many choices that we have. So if he's more likely to select, say, the first two, he has to be less likely to select the last alternative because um, they all, you know, they, they all have to kind of cancel out. And um, that's what causes these marginal effects to sum up to zero. And the interpretation for the marginal effects would be that each unit increase in the independent variable would increase or decrease the probability of selecting alternative J by the marginal effect expressed as a percent. That's the interpretation. Okay, so one thing that uh, a lot of authors bring up is the independence from irrelevant alternative property. And um, here they're talking about the odds ratio in the multinomial logic model that it's independent of other alternatives. So if we have choices j and k, the odds ratio, if we take those probabilities, pij divided by pik, and you can look at the formulas on the previous slide, if we divide those two, we would have exponent wi prime, and you would have gamma j minus um, gamma k. So one of the weaknesses of this model is known as the red bus and the blue bus, and you can Google it and read more about that. But uh, the thing is that if you had a choice between a car and a blue bus, and then if you introduce a red bus, that should, that will not change the probability. But say people would be indifferent whether or not they are riding a red bus or a blue bus. So that's considered a big prob problem of the um, of the logic model here, especially when you have choices that consumers uh, are kind of indifferent to. 
So you gotta watch out for those. You have to give the choices that are very, very distinct. Not like, do you want cereal with this kind of flavor or this kind of flavor? Because people might be indifferent between that. So, so far we talked about the multinomial logit model. We could also have the multinomial probit model. And it's significant, it's, it's, uh, that's similar to the logit model, just like the binary probit model is similar to the binary logit model. So the only difference is that we will use the standard normal CDF and the probability uh, that yi would be equal to j would be equal to phi of xij times beta. And so it would be, it would just take a little bit longer for a probit model to obtain results. Um, and the coefficients would be different by a scale factor, but the margin effects would be similar. So everything that you know about how the probit model relates to the logit model would would be valid here as well. Okay, so now I will talk about the conditional logit model. And this model is used with alternative invariant and alternative variant regressors. So we have probability that observation i will choose an alternative j would be this big expression. So we would have in the numerator, we would have exponent of xij beta plus um, wi gamma j. And in the den uh, denominator, we would have summation of all these exponents over all the alternatives from k equal 1 to m. So notice here one thing. These are the terms that we had from the multinomial uh, logit models before. Notice that the wi, this is a variable like the income, varies from individual to individual but doesn't vary over the alternative. Therefore, it does not have the j subscript on that. But the coefficients do. Gamma j has the j subscript, which means that each of the alternative would get a different coefficient. On the other hand, these um, alternative variant regressors, x, i, j, varies over i and varies over j. So uh, they would have a coefficient of beta that will not vary based on the, um, on the alternative. So that's the one thing to, um, to notice here. So the conditional logit model would have j minus one sets of coefficients gamma j because we're normalizing one set to be equal to zero for those case-specific regressors. And it would have only one set of coefficients beta for the alternative-specific regressors. So you have to watch out which are which. Um, and the probabilities for choosing each alternative would sum up to one. Uh, why? Because in the numerator we only have one of the expressions and in the denominator we have some of them, some, the sum of all of them. And the coefficients for the alternative invariant regressors, gamma j, they would be very similar uh, in treatment uh, to the multinomial logit model. We would have normalization where one, of, one set of the coefficients would be normalized to zero and then the rest would be interpreted to the base category. For the other coefficients, beta though, uh, yeah, and, and the rest is, is exactly the same as in the multinomial, uh, in the multinomial logit model. But the coefficients for the alternative specific regressors, beta, we would need no normalization for them, and there will be one set of coefficients across all our alternatives, and the coefficient interpretation would be that an increase in the price of one alternative decreases the probability of choosing that alternative and increases the probability of choosing the other alternatives. So we're not talking about any of the alternatives. We're just talking about its alternative, the, the alternative that individual I picked, and all the rest that they did not pick. So for the marginal effects, um, we would have that an increasing regressor on the probability of selecting alternative j would be equal to this expression, pij delta minus pik times beta. And um, so here we would have j sets of marginal effects uh, for both the alternative-specific and case-specific regressors. 
Um, for each alternative specific variable xij, there would be j times j uh, sets of marginal effects. And we would see later on with the, with the example y. Uh, the marginal effects of each of the variables uh, would sum up to zero. And the marginal effects interpretation would be that each unit increase in the independent variable increases the probability of selecting the k alternative and decreases the probability of the other alternatives by the marginal effect expressed as a percent. Hopefully these things will become a lot more clear when I give an example in the next video. It's, it's a little bit abstract to, t to talk about them now. So we would finish with the mixed logic model. And one thing to mention here is that in the, lit in the literature, you will see some people use the term mixed logic model also for the conditional logic model because it has a mixture of both alternative variant and alternative invariant regressors. So um, be careful and kind of watch the how these models are defined as you're seeing them in the literature. So if you see the mixed logic model, it's also called the random parameters logic model, and that would specify utility to the ith individual for the j alternative to be this expression. So um, we would have, again, wij uh, times beta i and wi times gamma ji plus um, eij. So notice that this is exactly what we had before here. Um, we would have on the x variable, we would have i and j subscript. Um, and we don't have the j uh, subscript here. And here we do, but don't have it on the, on the w. So if, if a variable does not vary by alternative, the parameter will. And if, if a variable varies with the alternative, the parameter won't. What's different here is that we have i parameters on uh, i subscripts on the parameters. We haven't seen the other models like that. Um, so this is uh, this is where the randomness kind of uh, could go into the model. And here we would decompose this randomness of um, beta i, which is considered random, by being beta, which is a parameter that you would think of plus um, nu of i where this one would have a normal uh, normal distribution and same for gamma ij um, we would also decompose it into a parameter that does not vary with i and one that that does okay so the means of these parameters we would put here and here and so we would have parameters like the ones we had before. And here we would have like the standard deviations of those, uh, of the, uh, of those variables uh, in there. Uh, and we would estimate coefficients on those. So this is how these random parameter models are decomposed. Um, the introduction of these parameters has a one attractive property, and that is inducing correlation across alternatives. Um, so the combined error would now be correlated across alternatives. So the probability that individual I would be selecting an alternative J would be uh, this thing now. And see, I called it a conditional logic model. I need to change this to a mixed logic. But in general, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the authors just use those interchangeably. So these are the these are the parameters that we had before in the conditional model, and now we're putting those parameters as well. That now we would have um, uh, we would have parameters that depend on i, and this is the unique thing about the mixed logic model. So the mixed logic model would um, relax the IIA assumption by allowing parameters to be normally or log normally distributed. And uh, when you estimate these mixed logic models, you will need to specify which parameters will be estimated as random. And if they're random, that implies that the effect of particular regressor on the chosen alternative would vary across the individuals because that parameter has an i 
subscript. Okay, so um, the mixed logic model would produce random parameters coefficients for both the regressor xi and for the standard deviation of the regressor, the standard deviation of xi. And the way we would interpret these regressors would be uh, when an independent variable increases, the consumers are more or less likely to um, choose this alternative, and the coefficient on the standard deviation of the regressor would be that there would be a heterogeneity across individuals with respect to the effects of each independent variable on the alternative chosen. So it's not like just one parameter describes all, there is variation in it. Okay, so this was a little uh, theoretical introduction to these models, the multinomial models. And now please make sure that you also watch the examples and hopefully things will become a lot clearer then. Thanks for watching.